Hello and welcome back everyone to part 2 of In My Shadow. Today's part will get a lot more angsty. There is a content warning for like stalking, which is the theme of this video series, so be warned. And now let's go with the fanfic where I said mm, two to three parts would be sufficient and the fanfic was like, no, oh, nope. So let's go. As the days went by, Atsuma became more and more convinced of his fading sanity. It was almost every day now that when he left the house, he was accompanied by the looming fear of being watched. As soon as he had taken a few steps outside, the hairs on his neck stood up and his heart was racing. He began to look around more frantically, but time and time came up empty-handed. In the absence of an obvious cause for his sudden paranoia, Everyone looked suddenly suspicious. The old lady tending to hold on, the exhausted student almost falling asleep on the commute home, and even the girl he scared half to death as he jumped when she handed him back his phone that had fallen from his pocket. It got progressively worse and was particularly intense when he was out alone. He started hearing steps following him. He didn't know when they became distinct from the crowd around him, but there was a certain pattern to them that would occur again and again. The same rhythm, the same speed, the same weight, and it was always just behind him. But when he turned around, there was nothing. In the sea of faces, he never recognized one that could fit the pattern. No one seemed to look at him, and yet everyone did. He only ever felt safe when he arrived at practice or at home. The footsteps followed him into stores, on the train, and cafes, and even to Asimu's shop. Wherever he went, they were right behind him. And yet, although the circumstances varied greatly, he never noticed anyone distinct. He felt as though he was being chased by Peter Betasan. An insane thought meant as a joke. But it was one of these evenings he returned from the grocery store that he found himself stepping aside and saying, After you, Peter Betasan. As expected, it didn't help. He wasn't sure whether he should have been more freaked out if it did, but he could feel his sanity drifting away further and further. It was as if the words had prompted things to get much worse instead of resolving them. The feeling of being stared at and the footsteps persisted, but now there was more. Things that felt out of place, like the chocolate box from a couple of days ago, one day, he had returned to his locker only to realize that he had forgotten to pack a fresh shirt. The other, he lost the bracelet he wanted to give Aaron and felt awful about it. His nerves were growing more tense with each day and managing the growing paranoia while also hiding it became a close to impossible task. He was torn between not wanting to leave the house alone and not wanting his partners to accompany him, lest they'd see what he had succumbed to, or worse, experience it themselves. He craved the validation that this was real and that he wasn't becoming insane, but what would that mean? His stomach turned at the possibility and after checking his surroundings for the upteenth time, he was convinced it couldn't be. There was no one. He was just another stranger in a crowd of them. Yet, his partners weren't blind, and Atsumu was progressively losing more and more sleep over this. He didn't want to tell them how bad it had gotten. If these were hallucinations, he didn't want to know, and least of all, he wanted them to know. He snapped at them within the last three days alone more times than he could count, and every time he felt progressively more awful, but he shut every attempt of them to help out and locked himself out of their reach. He even slept in the guest room for a couple of nights. 
That idea, however, was quickly discarded when on the second night he heard a tapping on the window and practically died of a heart attack. It startled him so intensely that he landed on the floor with a low thud. He crawled away from the window as quickly as he could, out of breath and only a few seconds away from screaming his lungs out. He didn't stop until his back hit the wall and everything came crashing down on him. Despite the utter terror coursing through his veins, all that escaped his throat was a whimper as he started to curl himself up into a ball and started sobbing silently. Tears ran down his face like waterfalls and he shut his eyes in the hopes it would all just go away. He couldn't breathe. He couldn't do anything but lay on the floor, sobbing and praying for solace. Solace came in the form of exhaustion as he fell asleep in his uncomfortable position on the ground. Nobody found him, and he didn't awake until his body began to shiver from the cold morning breeze. It was then that he shot up as if struck by electricity. The window was ajar. He knew. He just knew that it had been closed. Of course it had been closed. As of recently, he double-checked every lock in the house when the others went watching. Every curtain he came across had been closed tightly to block out whatever horror had been haunting him outside of the house. And yet, the window was open. He stared at it, processed it for exactly 10 seconds, scanned the room and then just ran. He bolted out of the room and into the bathroom, checking twice if the way too small window was closed and turning the lock. This was it? He had lost it. Tears ran down his cheeks once more, and he pressed a hand tightly to his mouth to muffle his cries. When he finally managed to move again, he suddenly couldn't reach the toilet fast enough as nausea overcame him. After emptying his already empty stomach, his eyes fell on the clock, realizing why, luckily, none of his partners had awoken yet and noticed his descent into madness. It was 7.45 a.m. on a Sunday. With looking at the clock, his eyes automatically followed a little to the right where the mirror showed him the gruesome reality of the situation. He wouldn't be able to hide this from his partners. The circles under his eyes looked drawn on so dark had they become. He was pale and sickly. His pupils were blown wide as if on drugs and the panic was etched into his expression no matter how much he tried to look indifferent. And then he started laughing. He was sure he must have lost it as the quiet chuckle echoed through the room while the tears still hadn't ceased. (laughs) To compose himself seemed like an impossible task, an unreachable demand to adhere to. His hands were shaking as he found the edges of the sink and with slow, uncoordinated movements he washed out his mouth and brushed his teeth. He would have showered, but he didn't want to alert the others, so he half-heartedly washed his hair over the sink, not bothering to style it afterward. He pulled out a concealer to hide the dark circles, but it did little to erase the dead look in his eyes. Afterward, he threw on a hoodie still laying on the couch, but didn't change the sweatpants he slept in and went outside. Immediately, the by now familiar feeling was back. He was being watched. His entire senses screamed, threat. It had edged closer and closer to the house, and now, just stepping outside, the dread welcomed him. A manic smile stretched his lips, and he almost cried again, but instead, he just proceeded. His aim, the Ani Jeremia. He couldn't face his partners like this. And in the absence of a plan, the only other place to go to was his twin brother's restaurant. As was his new habit, he embarked on his journey with quick steps, taking on a fast pace. Whenever he had walked to practice with Sakusa the past week, he had practically dragged them from A to B, much to the ace's discomfort, even more so because Atsuma refused to answer why. Their play had been off too lightly. As soon as he turned to want the train station, the footsteps following him reappeared. He fastened his pace even further, but didn't bother looking around anymore. 
Instead, he searched the way ahead for any reflections that might give away their source. Sometimes he thought he caught a glimpse of a shadowy figure, but as soon as it appeared, it was already gone again. Every time he whipped his head around and every time no one was there. The frustration and panic grew, not by distance, but by second, even when he was finally sitting on the train. There were other passengers. They were all suspicious and not at all. The reflections and shadows seemed to be mocking him, as though they had grown ugly faces with mocking smirks. He couldn't tell if the shadowy figure from before was among them, but when he exited on the station, the footsteps returned. And even when the door of the Oni Jeremiah closed behind him, he couldn't relax. Well, don't you look awful today? His brother greeted him, teasing as usual, though his tone was enough to know that he had obviously picked up that something was wrong. Who wouldn't in this state? That was why he was here, and not at home. He didn't reply and just sat down at the counter. First regulars had already taken their places at the various tables, but the counter was empty and Atsumu was grateful for that. No one spoke to him and he spoke to no one. He didn't want to look at them anymore. Anyone he saw turned into a monster in his head. Even Osamu didn't say anything else to him at first. He probably still had an order to finish. He was both wrong and right, he acknowledged, as his twin served him his favorite onigiri on a small plate. It's on the house. If you tell me why you look like this is your first meal in days. Atsumu glanced at the onijiri, then at his brother, before his gaze dropped again. He couldn't look at him for too long. He didn't want to see the concern, or worse, that his mind would twist Asumu into a monster as well. It didn't feel like he could tell him, but he still nodded. Maybe it didn't have to be the whole truth. Maybe he could just try and make something up. He felt like crying again. Did you fight with the others? Don't you have some other customers to tend to first? He thought he'd have some time to steal himself, but Asumu shook his head. Have you looked at the clock since you fell out of bed? It's too early for that. Atsumu flinched. His first thought was how he could know that, and for a moment he was almost overwhelmed by the instinct to run. The guild followed immediately after. Awesome, he wouldn't do that. This was his brother he was thinking about. It was just a figure of speech. His lower lip trembled and he bit down on it tightly to stop it until he could taste blood. The familiar pressure behind his eyes built up again and his breathing went rigid. Tsumu? God, Tsumu! His brother grabbed him by his shoulder and shook him slightly. It caused him to flinch again, but he doubted it was noticeable with all the trembling. Come here. He walked around the counter and coaxed Atsumu to stand up while supporting his weight in full. Atsumu could do nothing but comply as the other guided him upstairs to his apartment. The door had barely closed when Atsumu already called out to his boyfriend. Rin? Thank you so much for watching to the end. I hope you liked it. If you did, remember to leave a like because it really helps this channel grow. And don't forget to subscribe so you won't miss out on the next parts. Editing this and knowing what's about to come? Yep, this will be this year's Halloween special. I hope you will like it. Though don't worry, the next few parts have less horror elements and then some parts have some more and yeah this is it, it's gonna be lots of fun special thanks to my nerdy nekos by the way you support this channel so much if you also want to become a nerdy neko check out the join button under this video and here are my other social media but yes tell me what you thought about the sound effects and of course check out the other videos in the end card and have a wonderful and amazing day oh and favorite quote under the pin comment Step three. Grow hard about what you wanna be. Step four. Everybody just do your thing. Wake up. Today's gonna be a good day. Wake up. 